Hey everyone, uh, welcome to an impromptu streaming of uh, More Than You Asked For. That's a little bit of JavaScript and a whole lot of other things with me, your boy, uh, Kyle Shevlin, on the mic, bringing the flows tonight, you know, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so my wife is out with friends tonight and uh, I had nothing better to do um, than to come, you know, hang out with y'all. Um, you know, I love hanging out with everyone and uh, I love chatting with y'all and uh, it's just a really fun time. So, I mean... To say that I had nothing better to do is like the wrong way to say it, right? Because this is an awesome thing to do, and I'm totally stoked to be here with y'all, and uh, uh, can't wait for the people to to join, and we're just gonna have a good time tonight. So, um, yeah, I've got a I've got a nice setup tonight. Uh, not only do I have, you know, obviously all the the mechanics that I always have. I got the mic here and the camera there, and you know, my screen and my terminal and stuff, but um, I decided that uh, I would bring a little snack. So I've, I've got some popcorn for me throughout the evening. And, uh, you know, I got my uh, trusty beer. And, uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, we're going to have some fun tonight, I think. And, uh, yeah, so I'm waiting for a few people to get in the chat before we get going. Um, you know, there's no reason to be in a rush. I've got no real agenda tonight. I've kind of got a game plan or two, but uh, I, I want to see what y'all think. So, um, in fact, I might pull up the Twitch chat so I can chat with y'all while you chat with me, and uh, we can. There, there might be some some uh, some craziness there. I guess I don't. I don't know. I don't know. So, um, I'm gonna pull it up. Uh, you know what? Look at me, silly me. I've got my new tab, my awesome uh, Chrome extension thing, and I already have it set up, so I should just go to that. Oh, this is my dashboard. Y'all can see my stats. Um, actually, I'm not entirely sure what my stats will say, but hey, oh, hey, check this out. I could see the chat room. I could see a little bit of me. I think a viewer just showed up. Um, achievement completed, know your stuff, sweet. Um, you know, send a little message to everybody. It's kind of interesting to see the, um, to see the delay, like, right now, because I can kind of see what I say and when I say it and then when it comes through there but yeah um, I won't keep this up all night I just uh, maybe I'll pull it down here I'll pull it out of sight so y'all don't have to see me doing that all night all right so I have a couple ideas of what we could maybe cover tonight um, and this is kind of why I wanted to wait until a few people showed up because I would love to get some I would love to get some votes on like what a good good topic might be. Um, so yeah, I've got a I've got a couple ideas. In fact, why don't I do this? Um, I will. Uh, got to get my stuff all set up, but uh, what? Actually, let's send Markdown. What should Kyle work on tonight? So I have I have really like two ideas, um, and one of them I I honestly both of them are really cool ideas to me, and um, I'd really love to get input. Um, so the first idea is an introduction to functional programming so some of you might know uh, I got my first conference proposal uh, accepted and I'll be speaking next month at uh, Google DevFest uh, DevFest Silicon Valley I still haven't gotten that all under my fingers oh man already how what is the thing to that GDG DevFest Silicon Valley maybe I can get it to pull up um, that's the meetup. 
that's that. Oh, what what is the link? That's the link. Uh, right there. And like this is super exciting to me. Uh, I've been starting to try and have the courage to reach out and uh, put out um, CFPs and um, you know, I don't know. I, I really enjoy public speaking. Uh, I did it for years when I was a pastor and uh, I kind of miss doing it and uh, I'm just super stoked. I'm way at the bottom, but I don't care. I, I don't care. There I am. Uh, I am I am on the speaker list. My face is there for people to know that I'm coming and I will be talking about stuff. Um, uh, I think this is funny. Uh, if you click in, you get to read my um, my little bio, and uh, I, I I didn't know what to put. I never know what to put about me. It's not like I've written like amazing open source libraries and everyone knows my name. I'm really just some, uh, uh, you know, I'm just an encouraging person on Twitter, and uh, I insert myself into everyone's conversations, right? Um, so I decided to go with Kyle Shevlin as a senior software engineer at Fastly, lover of JavaScript, hater of semicolons, and maintainer of a glorious beard. I hope you all agree. I think I'm doing some good maintenance right now. I'll probably need to trim it up before then, though. You know, don't want to go all scraggly before uh, my first conference talk. So pretty excited. Um, if you're in San Francisco or the Silicon, Silicon Valley and you want to come check me out or come just to the event, please do. I mean, we got some cool speakers. Uh, ben Lesh, uh, I'm kind of excited. I might get a chance to meet him and... Uh, uh, Shirley Wu, great friend of mine. I'm really excited to get to hang out with her a little bit more. There's some other some other cool people. Check it out. DevFest2017.gdg-sv.com. Like, here. I'll move that over here. And you should visit. Boom. That's what you should do. Anyways, I'll be talking about uh, functional programming as part of my talk, and I could definitely... Uh, walk through all the material that I'll cover in the talk for the most part and that could be a fun thing to do tonight like to, to kind of work through that because I need to continue to practice it anyways um, and you know some of you might not be able to make it so this would be a great chance for you to uh, um, see what uh, I'm I'm working on right now uh, we got someone in the chat we got uh, bites or bits is uh, you should tell me if it's a long eye or short eye. I've never seen two eyes before. I have no idea. Well, I've seen two eyes. Get it? Um, no idea what to. Uh, <laughs> no idea how to pronounce your name, but I'd love finding out. Um, how long have you been programming, and at what age did you start? That's a really great question. Thank you uh, for asking. Um, so I started programming probably around. I want to say twenty-seven. Uh, years old. I'm 32 right now. I've only been doing this. Uh, I've been doing it professionally just over four years. I just wrote a blog post about it actually, and I I I put it on Medium. Uh, maybe I can find it. Uh, uh, Kyle Shevlin, four years in is the title. Um, let's see if it comes up. There you go. Okay. Oh, hey, it's got 100 claps. I'll take it. Um, that's pretty sweet. Um, okay, yes, uh, just recently crossed my four-year milestone as a professional developer, and uh, I probably coded for about a year, year and a half before that. Um, so my story, in a, in a nutshell, was uh, I was originally, uh, I was in grad school. I was earning a master's in theology so that I could continue my um, the, my work as a pastor and as a minister. Um, and a friend of mine just happened to link on Facebook one day to Code Academy. Um, maybe some of you have been there and used this website before. Uh, but yeah, he linked to it. He had just made a course on it. And uh, I decided to start doing it. And I just worked through a bunch of stuff. And I kept doing it. And then I really struggled to find work for... Better almost a year, but every morning I'd get up, I'd make my pot of coffee, and I'd code for like three to four hours, and uh, like I would just find random tutorials and things to do 
to teach myself how to do this. So I just kept teaching myself and uh, I'd copy the work of other people till I understood it and that sort of thing. And then um, I got I got really lucky when my wife and I moved to Portland. Um, I, m I made an acquaintance with someone who was a developer and they got coffee with me one day and I showed them what I'd worked on and they were like, you're good enough to go get a job. So why don't you go get a job? And in two months I had my first job at a place called Fine, <clears throat> excuse me, at a place called Fine, F-I-N-E, uh, and actually, like, I have some memorabilia of theirs. This is from our uh, summer retreat in 2015. It's kind of fun, little coaster out of uh, some wood for my uh, my beer here. Uh, but yeah, that's how long I've been doing it. Um, I'm not someone who started doing this at a really young age. Uh, not not compared to lots of people. Lots of people pick this up at uh, much younger ages, especially today. You know, with a, a great amount of resources available to people. Like, I, you know, I just think it's so exciting how early you can learn or how you can learn if you just put in the time for free. Like, it's just, it's a really cool time to be a programmer. You get to learn a lot. Um, let's see. Tyler, Fr hey, Tyler, what's up, buddy? Uh, I have uh, Ty Fry Tyler or Tyler Fry on Twitter. If you go find him, I'm assuming it's him. Um, you've probably seen this before, but it was really good when I first started to get into functional programming. The mostly adequate guide to functional programming. You're totally right, dude. I have been, uh, uh, I've read that, um, several times now. Uh, I have, in fact, it's on my, uh, my little tablet and I read it on the bus almost every day to and from work because I'm not going to lie. I've had to read the last three chapters, which are on functors, monads, and applicative functors. I've had to read them like six or seven times to really start to get it in my head. Um, uh, the first six or seven chapters, I think I would say six, the seventh one is a, uh, is a, a just a ex coding example chapter. Uh, those went in my head pretty darn easily, and that's actually kind of what my talk will be about, will be about like going from nothing to working up through occurring partial application and composition uh, with the focus on like using um, composition as a way to declarative write declarative code that we can clean up and refactor code bases with. So that's kind of what my talk is going to be about. But uh, yeah, uh, um, I've definitely checked out that book and I recommend it to everyone. Let me pull up a link for people who um, might need to see it. See it. Uh, this this book is written by um, a guy named Brian Lonsdorf. He's really great. He uh, his Twitter handle, as you might have seen up there, is Doctor Boolean. Um, so you can go find him on Twitter. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't seem to tweet a ton, but he's he's active enough. Especially if you like send him a tweet, He'll, you'll prod him out of his uh, whatever he's doing. He's probably hunkered down at his computer uh, writing monoids and stuff like that. But uh, this is a really great book and it's free and you can get uh, a, an EPUB or a, like a Kindle version of it to, to read it. And uh, it's just really solid. Um, it's a great introduction. I recommend it to everyone. Okay, catching up on the stream. Uh, it's actually supposed to be Blitzes, but the name was already ta taken. I'm not particular on how you pronounce it. Good to know. I'll try and remember that it's Blitzes though. Um, and then we got BKD705. Hey, finally caught a Kyle Shevlin stream. Well, thank you. Thank you for catching one. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, coming and hanging out. Um, we're going to have a good time tonight. I don't know if y'all were here already, but uh, I'm really excited about tonight. Uh, this is just me hanging out. My wife's out with friends. I figure why not have some of my friends come hang out you know, with me. And uh, it's, um, I'm just hoping that we have a good time. We just, uh, you know, we'll do some coding, um, but I'm happy to keep asking questions and I'm happy, or, or keep answering questions. I'm also very happy, like, if, if people have a question that they want me to help them work through or something like that, we can make this time uh, whatever you want. But uh, I'm excited about tonight. I've got some uh, popcorn here to, um, to snack on. So, you know, those few moments I don't talk, right? Um, pretty excited some buttery goodness there have to have a napkin if you're gonna have some greasy buttery salty goodness and you're gonna try and code because you don't want to get your laptop or your keyboard all all janked up so and then I've already said you know every episode's got to have alcohol in some way 
Um, if you're underage, don't be drinking. Um, I, I'm not trying to promote that kind of activity, but responsible drinking is great. Good stuff. Uh, once you go craft, you can't go back, right? Can't go back. And we got Jen joining us. Uh, hi, Jen. Uh, glad you could make it tonight. Um, hope all your Christmas decor and that sort of thing is going well. Um, are you like, you can let me know, but are you like knitting stockings? Do you do like custom stockings every year? Because, I mean, that would be badass. Um, I don't know shit about knit knitting. I just know and um that people love it and it uses yarn and I use yarn but in a totally different way, right? Haha. <laughs> little 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 dev humor there. Um so back to what we can uh talk about or work on tonight. So I thought one thing I could do is I could walk you through all the little pieces that um I'm going to kind of teach in my my talk. Um that would be good practice for me. Um, I kind of thought I might do a series on it at some point for the stream, but, um, you know, we could do this as the one-off. Um, the other thing I thought about doing, I've had this crazy idea, crazy idea. And this is where y'all can come in, because you might be able to, uh, to help me out. But um, I've thought about trying to write my own React. Okay, hear me out. Um, I've had this idea of like moving forward in my career. One of the things I'd like to get better at is I'd like to get better at writing um, software versus writing UIs. I'm, I consider myself a really solid UI developer. Um, I'm really solid with CSS and like the SAS preprocessor and uh, post CSS and, and understanding all of that. I'm really good at that kind of like um, UI architecture stuff. That's something I, I have a talent for. And then the last year and a half, I've really focused on developing my JavaScript skills. And I've, I've fallen in love with the language and it's really awesome. And I've especially come to love React and, and stuff in that, that ecosystem, but uh, I'm good at writing UIs. I want to get better at writing software. They're kind of, to, in my mind, they're slightly two different things. I'm not saying they don't require some of the same skills, but, um, you know, I didn't spend a lot of time writing, you know, um, a bunch of classes and inheritance and, and understanding how to, like, make these interfaces that all work together, right? Like, I, I've mostly spent my life knowing how to... Uh, write the right amount of wrapping divs to solve my problem, correct? So um, I thought it could be a cool idea to try and write React, like like not, not to the T, nowhere near it, but um, could I make some JavaScript library, as crappy as it may be, that can um, render uh, HTML through JavaScript, that can handle state updates, um, uh, and that could, uh, you know, uh, give me some kind of declarative way of like, like, um, making websites with this kind of component architecture. And I've been thinking about this because, uh, one, I think it would be a great exercise to try and do. So a part of me wants to do this tonight and have y'all help me out. Give me your ideas. Um, but I also like, I'm probably going to fail. I don't know that I'm, I'm quite good enough to do it, but I think I could get something that kind of works, but that could be a lot of fun. Who knows? We could probably do both at some point in tonight, but, um, let me know in the chat, which one you'd prefer me to start with. And, you know, we'll just get going. We'll, we'll make it happen and we'll have a good time tonight. So I'll give you all a few moments cause there's a delay between, uh, my talking and your ability to respond. But uh, I guess in that moment, I'm just going to sip some beer and catch up on the chat. Um, Jen says, hi, yes. So three years ago, after several years of teasing, I made all my teammates six-inch Christmas stockings with personalized designs and their initials. That is awesome. Uh, how many teammates did you have? Like, I mean, if you had only a few, like, I could see that being really easy to squeeze in. But if you had, like, 30, that would be ridiculous. But 
But uh, yeah, I've had to make them for all the new devs every year since. Wow. So we've got one vote for uh, an introduction to functional programming. That would be pretty cool. Let's see if we get some other votes. Um, if I need to bump this up, I don't know if y'all can see it. I think you can see it, but this year is nine. Wow. Sounds like your company's growing a bit, Jen. I'm going to eat some more popcorn. I know it's kind of rude to eat and talk at the same time, so please forgive me. Um, I don't intend to be rude. I intend to be full in my belly. You know, I've never thought to ask this, but um, if you want to let me know, I would love to find out where everyone is from. If you're cool with it, like not your address, but like what city are you from? Or if you're from a, a country or something you're comfortable with, if you want to share it in the chat, I would love to know. It would just be cool to kind of see um, where everyone's from. Four devs to over 20. Jeez, that's uh, that's growth. It's good stuff. All right. Well, I've got one vote for an introduction to functional programming. So I think I'll just start there. And uh, we got Northern Minnesota. Hey, I had a... I actually don't know who's still living there, but um, my great-grandparents and my uh, great-aunt and great-uncle are from uh, just outside Duluth, Minnesota in uh, Two Harbors. So I used to spend... Um, significant portions of my summer up there so that's cool it's got to be a bit chilly right now I'm guessing we got some Minneapolis in the house uh, I used to um, I worked for an organization called Youth Encounter which is based out of St. Paul so um, I mean I wasn't in Minneapolis a lot but I spent a few weeks there from time to time when we they would have us in near the office we were actually I don't know if I've told you all this. I spent a year uh, basically living in a van with five other people, and I traveled, uh, like I covered 60,000 miles in a Ford E350 with a trailer, and we were doing worship and youth ministry for a year, and it was crazy and very challenging and difficult, but um, the organization was out of um, St. Paul, so they'd occasionally have to have us come back and do some training and stuff. And then... Um, we got we got Nick Code Monkey or or Jen. You might hear me keep saying her real name. Once I learn people's real names, I I try and focus on that. Um, she's outside of she's in uh she's a little outside of Salt Lake City, so so you know Utah's got a got a pretty big JS scene these days. Um, let's see all the Utahns I know that are doing that. Um, well you got Jen. And then my buddy Brian Holt, uh, Kent C. Dodds, um, Matt Zabriski, Jameson Dance. There's a bunch of good devs out of there. It's it's like this little pocket of, um, of technology. It's kind of cool. So yeah, let's do an intro to functional programming. Sounds good to me. All right, so I've given this talk a bunch. Uh... And I just gave it to my team just the other day. And so um, let me make a new, rep uh, not a repo, but like a new folder um, here. And we'll call it, um, I actually made my own little, it's, it's, a, it's just a simple command that combines the making of the directory and seeding into it immediately. But it's kind of nice. Um, let's see, we shall call it uh, Mount Yaf which is uh, the name of my kind of stream is more than you asked for. So I actually have thought it'd be cool someday to make like a logo that's like a mountain and we'll call it the Yaf Mountain um, or something. I don't know. It, just, it has to catch on first, but I've, I've had the idea. But we'll call it Mount Yaf Intro to FP. And then, uh, you know, let's start. Let's just start a, um, a project real quick. Um, and then we'll get init this, not that, I don't know that I'll push it up, but we'll, we'll do it anyways. And, uh, we'll touch, uh, read me. Yeah. And then, <laughs> yeah, 
command index.js and we'll open this up and yes for everyone who's going to ask I still use sublime text uh, it works dandy for me if you um, you want to know what um, what uh, I'm sorry theme I'm using I'm using the oceanic next theme so a lot of people mistakenly think I'm using like Adam or something like that because it's close to the default colors of Adam but I, I am not all right let's open that read me uh, in the mount yaf intro to functional programming um, I think it's I think it's nice to call it like Mount Yap. You know, Professor Frisbee is actually like this character that Brian Lonsdorf has created, and that's that relates to this uh, introduction. Like, this is actually like his character. He has made um, he's made Egghead IO videos that are claymation that are this character and some students in a classroom, and he teaches functional programming. And uh, but yeah. Um, I think it's kind of neat. Maybe we, I can have this weird universe called Mount Yaff. I have no idea. Tyler looks like he's heading out. Thanks for joining us, Tyler. I really appreciate it. Um, have yourself a good night, man. Um, all right. So the first thing that's important to know in functional programming, especially in JavaScript, is we have to, we have to understand this concept of of um, of functions as first class citizens. I had to think for a moment what I want to call call it, but functions as first class citizens. And uh, I won't just write um, the readme. I'm just kind of doing it as we go along, right? Um, but what functions as first class citizens means is that functions are equal to the other primitives in the language, right? So like if we have something like const foo equals bar, right? This is a string primitive. Or if we have 42, this is a number primitive. This makes sense, right? Like we um we have these building blocks of our our language. Other ones would be like a boolean, for example. This is the boolean primitive. And these are all first class citizens, right? Um, they're they're uh, immutable in a way like there's no reduction you can really do of them they are the base of our language well what's great about JavaScript and other functional languages like this would be a prerequisite is that functions are like on par they're equivalent with these other primitives so in other words like I can have a variable foo and I can assign it a function, right? Like we can use the old syntax and we can say return, uh, just they, I'll just do something silly like that or, you know, true. But like foo is now a function and um, first class citizens can be passed in anywhere else other first class citizens can be passed. So if I have another function such as um, uh, const, uh, let's say I have a function that needs, uh, a, for some reason, uh, a boolean or two. Uh, we'll call this and actually, and we'll give it an x and a y, and we'll return uh, x and y. Okay, very simple function, right? Um, what we're going to do now, because functions are first class citizens, right? Like we can actually supply a function. Uh, or, or we can actually, um, in this case, we won't just give it a function, we'll call the function uh, as an argument to our other function, right? Because they're on par with numbers, strings, and, and, and other, and booleans, and, and other primitives. So <clears throat> this is the first thing required to like kind of get going in functional programming. It's very obvious, but it's worth doing. So now in this case, um, I could do and, We'll call foo. We know it returns true. And if we return true in this one, if we were to run this, like actually, we can save this and we can let's let's log it out. Console, and we'll call this the result. Um, and then we'll console log our result. And we'll just do it in node. Okay, so um, if I run uh, node index we should get uh, oh 
Silly me. I mixed my two syntaxes. That is silly. And we'll just do this. All right. So does that make sense what I screwed up? Uh, I just had this all mixed up, but we got it now. We have an and function. It takes an X and a Y and returns uh, whether they're an and. Um, so let's try this again. And it returns true, which is which is what we expected. If functions are first class citizens and their results, they're not, they can be passed in and their results uh, will be treated like any other primitive. Uh, if we change this to false, or we were to change the other one, I'm actually, I'm gonna make a script really quick so I don't have to, um, we'll call it start, and it'll just be node index.js. Um, I think I can even just do, if I want, but, well, I'll do that. Um, and not that it's any shorter, it's actually not, but, in fact, it took longer. <laughs> That's funny. Um, good to know. Um, probably because it had to instantiate yarn. So that was silly. I'll keep that there in case we want to use it in the past. But like, that's the first thing you need to know about functional programming. You need to know that functions are first class citizens and, um, and that leads us directly into the second thing. So let me update that like, this simply means that functions are equivalent or can be can be treated as primitives just like strings uh, numbers and booleans the next thing you need to know and you're probably already doing this and we actually already did uh, without without thinking about it is that we need to understand higher order functions so a higher order function uh, is a function <laughs> I'm gonna end up using that word a lot just so you know I mean it's it's blatantly obvious that that would be the case with functional programming but um, I just want you to know like I'm gonna I'm gonna use the word function like a thousand times so um, I'll do my best to be clear and you do your best to keep up and you let me know in the chat if I've lost you, that's all good. So I'm gonna get some popcorn in me. All right. So a higher order function does one or two, does, how should, I've yet to find the best way to say this. A higher order function must do at least one of the following. Ah, oh geez, what did I do? Gotta love it when you do a keyboard shortcut slightly incorrectly and uh, just screws everything up. Okay, that's what a higher order function is. A higher order function must do at least one of the following. It either takes a function as an argument or it returns a function and it can do both. Like you could take a function as one of the arguments and you could return a function. It's not, it doesn't call, you know, you don't call it a doubly higher order function, but um, that's what it means. And um, you probably have used these in your work already if you've been using JavaScript a while and you might not have really realized it. We, uh, we used it in our um, just now with uh, by supplying foo as an argument to our our function, right? Like this was one way of, of treating it as a higher order function. Um, and in functional programming, this is really important because um, what it does is is two things. Like returning functions will become something absolutely necessary to the work that we do. Um, but also uh, being able to pass functions in means not needing to do things like, well, even this, right? In functional programming, there's this concept called uh, uh, referential transparency. And what that means is that a function is equivalent to its result. Like this call is as silly as it, it sounds, really kind of dumb 
It's almost like it doesn't make sense. But and foo false here is referentially transparent to the to the result that it gives. That's why we were able to store it in a variable, right? We can trust that contract. A function should give us the same result. At least this one will. Um, and so we were able to store it in a variable, right? And that result in this case is false, right? Referential transparency means um, instead of having to store it and pass it in, these are equivalent. And it's a fancy term and it, it doesn't really tell us much, but because functions can actually be passed into other functions in JavaScript, this is, a, 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 this is possible. Right, like one of my least favorite code smells that I, it's not a smell, it's just annoying, I guess, would be to do what I just did, right? Like I constantly see code that will save the result of some function, um, uh, foo bar, right? And then immediately return result. And all this does is take a little bit more memory that's not necessary to do on the engine. Um, if these, if calling foobar is equivalent to what it returns, then we can just do, uh, you know, let's do it this way. What can I do? Then we can just return the result of foobar and we can trust that, right? So that's one small thing you can start to do in your code base refactoring wise. That'll actually go a long way. Or um, if you're doing it for some other reason, like you have another function, like let's say we have functions foo and we have functions bar, right? Like I often see if I want to supply the result of bar inside of foo, like I often see people do this uh, result and then return uh, foo bar result. This is wasteful. This is silly. Like this, uh, this is unnecessary. Like just do this with your code. Like uh, it's it's okay. I, I don't know what I did there. Somehow I've half pasted it. Oh, I put it in the middle of the word. Um, and you'll see this over and over again. This is actually something we're gonna get to by the end of this, right? So higher order functions are really important. Another higher order function would be returning a function, right? So um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but here's a good example. Um, let's get into the next topic, which is purity. But let's use higher order functions to, sh to describe purity to some degree. So uh, I'm seeing a few chats. I will. Uh, I'm gonna take a minute to snack on some popcorn, but I'm gonna answer this. So Lucas Frost he says, usually I store a function in a variable, describing it or something. I'm I'm guessing that's what your words were. Maybe you're on your phone or something. Um, that when I know that I'm going to use it more than once. Okay. That is a a valid thing to do. Um, I was not describing that. Um, if you were, for instance, doing something like result equals foo, right? Um, let's just ignore this for right now. But if for some reason you were also going to do stuff like result dot bar uh, dot map, or like if you had some reason to use result again and again, that I would actually advise you to do. Um, it's one of the reasons why I advise people like, let's say I have an object, um, with a few values, a one, B two, C three. And I need to call, uh, like, uh, things inside that object all the time. Like it's just old to, um, it's not just old, but it, it's actually slower to do stuff like object dot a and then object.b and object.c and if you're doing this over and over again because it has to go to that spot in memory right um, especially if they get nested um, I think that's a big one uh, if we if we actually had like this all as an object right uh, I'm gonna that'll work if I save this prettier should fix it thank you prettier um, 
it's better to destructure D, right? Instead of going down the extra layer, because um, what happens is rather than having to traverse in memory down, we've just placed a new spot in memory. And you know, most of the time you'll never notice this, but it is a small optimization you could do in your code. So destructuring is great when you're going to reuse something a lot. What I was talking about was literally like um, getting through a function, putting the result in an interim variable just to return the named variable and not do anything else with it. And I do see it quite a bit. Um, rather than just returning the function's result. It's like people have an aversion to, um, uh, to this. Like they, they, they have an aversion to returning something that they can't, uh, they don't know what it is yet. Well, this is the result, right? Like we know that. Um, but I've, I've run into people who have this, this, this aversion and uh, I often like have to be like, hey, can, can you just do this instead? It's cleaner. Um, there's no need to name things. Like, and there's, that's another problem. Naming things is hard, right? So you should do your best to painstakingly name things, but why name something if you don't even have to? If my function already tells me what I'm gonna get, like, um, uh, like I don't know what a good example is, but like get data, right? Like that, that probably tells me I'm gonna get data so I can return get data, right? that's enough to tell me what's going on. Um, I, I mean, you get in a, it just gets annoying to have to do something like this if you're not gonna do anything else with it. That's what I'm saying. So I think you make a good point. Um, I was making a slight distinction. Okay, so I'm gonna clear this up. But the next thing that we kinda need to talk about in terms of higher order functions is we need to talk uh, about uh, purity, and this will help me help. This will help me explain another part of higher order functions. So purity is um, a pure function. Is a function <laughs> that's great. It, it definitely is a function that um, returns the same output without side effects given the same input. So um, you've maybe heard of pure functions before, but this is the biggest culprit I, I see people doing. Um, I see people frequently um, writing really impure functions or not breaking their functions out in such a way that um, the impure parts are handled in one, one way and the pure parts are handled and uh, in another like organization because pure component i mean pure functions and components actually in react like stateless functional components should be pure functions so you'll hear me occasionally reference that but um pure functions will always give us the same output this makes them super testable and it's actually really important to um what we'll learn about currying and composition and all that when we get through it so like a pure function would be like an add function, for example. Um, let's write it the old way. So an add would take an X and a Y and return X plus Y, okay? This is a pure function. We know every time we hand add uh, some numbers like, um, we know that we'll get five every time, right? Uh, let's just run this in Node just to, to verify. And we get five, right? This is a pure function. There's, there's um, nothing that uh, it won't get out of this. And, and this is actually a great way to show higher order functions like in first class citizens and all that stuff we've talked about. We can actually do console log uh, I'm going to split on a second line just so it's easy. We could do add of add. We could do like two of one, and then we can do add uh, six of seven, right? Like these will all work. This will give us, uh, like, can I do my math quickly? It looks like 16, I think. Um, let's see what happens. 
16, right? And that's great. This covers first class citizens, it covers higher order functions, um, and it covers purity. Let me show you an impure ad just for uh, shits and giggles, right? So maybe in my program, I need to increment, uh, um, I need to increment um, an ID. Uh, so this is, this is, I would never quite do it this way. I'm not saying do IDs with numbers just this way. I'm just saying I might have some state outside of my function and uh, I will make an impure add that also takes an X and a Y. But maybe every time impure add is called, I will uh, update the next ID, right? And then I, I, I'll also return X plus Y. Now this is, um, while this is a really contrived small example, you see this all the time in code bases. You see a function that's doing too much and what it's doing is it's creating side effects. The side effect here is if I were to do console log um, impure add two, three, and I also did console log, that might help if I spelled it right, right? Like, and I console log next ID, right? We'll, we'll name these so that we see it for sure. Uh, yeah, next ID. If, if this was a pure function, I called it again, I would not only get the right result, I will get the right result adding wise, but I've changed state outside of my component. That's a, I'm sorry, outside of my function. That's a, that is what call makes this impure, right? So you'll see that next ID gets incremented uh, again. So impure add a five, next ID one, impure add a five, next ID two. And, and this is what we want to avoid. We want to avoid our functions having side effects. We want to be able to trust the contract we make with a function between its inputs and its outputs. We, we want to know, like, like basically functional programming requires almost entirely using uh, pure functions. But there does come a time, almost every, everything at some point needs to be impure. So side effects are like rendering stuff to the DOM. Um, side effects are like um, sometimes um, returning values and fetching data and that kind of thing. I'm sorry, I need a quick drink. For those of you wondering, I'm pretty sure this QQ Wake 3 guy is a, is a troll. He's been around these here parts a couple times. Um, so don't worry about him. Um, of course you could use math.add, but that's not the point here. Um, anyways, so w w when it comes to those kinds of side effects, because sometimes we need to have them, the way we handle making those things pure is by writing them in a way that returns a new function, right? Like, um, we use higher order functions to make our side effect functions pure. I'll explain that, watch. So let's say I have a function called get data. All right, maybe it takes a URL and what it's going to return is we'll call like fetch on the URL. We'll get, uh, uh, it, fetch will give us a promise and then our response will return the response dot JSON and that's what we'll return right so what makes this impure is that when i call get data um right now uh i could get any sort of response this is not the same i, I mean given a url right so i could give it like uh const url equals uh, twi uh twitch dot tv slash kyle shevin little self-promotion in there if I call get data URL, 
like I could get different responses and that makes it impure, right? Like I could get a response that eventually gives me some JSON or I can get a response that gives me like an error. Like maybe it times out, maybe it just hangs and doesn't do anything. This is impure. Um, and that could be a problem for our software. Uh, it might be challenging like the way we wanna compose and architect our software like if this is impure. So how can we make get data a pure a pure function? Well, we make it a pure function by returning a new function and thus delaying the fetch. Like this is a small distinction, but it makes a lot of sense. So const pure get data will also take a URL, but instead of returning our fetch, what we're going to return is a new function that does our fetch. And you might have noticed I'm starting to write these with uh, chained arrow functions, like like a series of arrow functions. This is kind of uh, really important to, um, not important, but I find it to be a really clean way to write functional code in JavaScript. So let's save that. Okay, so it, this all updated for us. Like I'm gonna pull this up and this is impure. Okay, whereas this, right, does this make sense why this is a pure function? I, I really wanna get your feedback in the, in the chat because this is probably a hard thing to do. What we know is that every time I call pure get data with the URL from above, like let me, let me actually do it this way, right? If I call pure get data with the URL, I will always get a function that has URL in in um, in its scope through uh, closure, and that function hasn't fired yet, right? Like I've I'm being returned a function that I would then call. So what I could call is like um, I could save this as like the impure fetch equals pure get data. And then what we would call this in, in functional programming, Hey everyone, hope we're back. Hope it's working. Sorry. Man, I don't know. I don't know what to do. My, um, My computer works uh, really well most of the time, um, but I do only have eight gigs of memory, and I don't know, maybe this, uh, the open broadcast software really eats it up or something. Um, it's just a shame, because like every once in a while it seems like it gets overloaded. Um, I mean, I turn everything off before I stream. I turn off like all my slacks, Discord, messages, um, Twitter, like I try and reduce all the, the Google, Chrome tabs I have open, and maybe I'll just have to start using Vim to even reduce um, Sublime Text usage. I don't know, but um, I'm back. I hope you stuck with me. Uh, send me something in the chat. Let me know you're here, and we'll get back to uh, our discussion on uh, functional programming. going to say hey to y'all really quick. All right, looks like people are still in the chat. Looks like we're back at it. I'm so sorry, folks. Maybe someday I will have nice internets and uh, everything will be all good. But anyways, 
So we were on to currying, and uh, so the bugs started to happen when I was explaining about impure fetch on line nine. Okay, that's great. I will back up. Thank you, Lucas. Okay. So we've talked about like pure functions or functions that return the same output given the same inputs without side effects, right? Getting data, like making an async call, is an impure act. It's an impure function because we might get a JSON response or we might get an error and um, this isn't and, and and if since we're using a promise like like we're also adding the fact that we're just waiting we're we're in this state of limbo waiting for it to happen um so one way that um functional programming uh, like frameworks and, and that kind of thing get around this is they delay the evaluation of their function their their fetch to um, a later time. And they do it just by returning another function. This gets us back to higher order functions, right? So if we look at line six, it's almost the same, right? We have almost the same signature, but what we have here, if we were to write like a type is like, uh, get data uh, takes a string and uh, returns JSON or an error. Right. Whereas here, uh, pure we pure get data uh, takes a takes a string and always returns a function. Like there's no there's nothing Im, impure about this one. I mean, instead, because it returns the function, what we've done is we've we're, we've been able to stash away and store our side effects until the absolute right time to call them. And while in most cases, uh, like for UI development, like it would seem like the right time is to call it like at this moment, right? Um, there could be occasions where like, we actually wanna delay this or we just wanna hand off the responsibility, as I was saying, to someone else and make sure that they call it appropriately. So like in this case, you know, we give them this impure fetch that we know is a function and we give them the opportunity to use it, but we want them to use it in, in a safe way. So they have to know like, hey, I know this is impure. Uh, in JavaScript, maybe an easy way to do it is a try catch. There's also, well, we could eventually talk about like functors of, uh, which would re return, uh, it could return a maybe of, of uh, our error. It could return a maybe of our response. It could return a maybe of, of null. Like, um, but we could guarantee we're returning a maybe. Um, we're not gonna cover functors tonight and they're not something I cover in my talk. Um, my talk is called Just Enough Functional Programming to be a Danger to Yourself and Coworkers. So, so that's kind of the distinction here between this impure one, I mean this pure, yeah, this impure one and this pure one is just the delaying of it. Does that make sense? You're always gonna get back a function with this one and this one we can't guarantee what we get back. Does it make sense? Killed off about half my popcorn. Not too bad for trying to talk the whole time. Okay. So the next topic that I wanted to cover was the topic of currying and partial application. So, and I had started to talk about um, uh, Haskell curry. Haskell Brooks curry. And I hope uh, this doesn't fail again, but this guy, this mathematician, um, super, super genius, smart dude. Um, his best work was in combinatory logic. And I'm actually thinking about like, um, like maybe doing some kind of uh, talk on this at some point. Uh, I think I think learning some um, symbolic logic could be really useful to programmers. But um, I mean, dude's so awesome. He has three programming languages named after him. You're probably most familiar with Haskell. 
and uh, like this is really cool. You should check it out sometime. But it's really closely related to uh, lambda calculus. Uh, lambda calculus is a formal system in mathematical logic that um, um, that uh, basically every function receives its arguments one at a time, which is what currying is. So if we go back here, currying is the act of taking a function which and transforming it such that it receives its arguments one at a time, returning unary functions awaiting the next argument until all arguments are received and then the final function is evaluated. I use some fancy words in there so I want to make sure to explain that. Um, so the biggest fancy word I think in there is unary. Unary is um, a function whose arity whose might not be quite the right word, is one. Well, what is arity, Kyle? Right? Arity describes how many arguments a function takes. You have unary, binary, ternary, quaternary, quaternary. I, can't, I think it's quaternary. Um, arity is just a word that describes how many arguments a function takes. And we don't really think about it a lot in JavaScript because we can write functions any old way we want. Um, but when you, you have to write your functions curried, they need to take one argument at a time. Um, and that's really important for eventually what we're, we're going to get to. Um, I want to take a second Lucas says, does maybe exist in the JavaScript API? I saw it when I was learning with Elm. Didn't know you could use it on JS. Maybe does not exist in the JavaScript API. It's not just something that, that's there. Um, I was using it as, a, as an imaginary type, um, and I probably got ahead of myself, so I apologize for that. Um, but you could write a maybe, no problem. And in fact, in that mostly adequate guide to functional programming, um, in chapter eight, you will write uh, a maybe with him. So go ahead and check that out. Um, I won't do it right now. Maybe we can cover that book at some other time and we can work on uh, explaining the book and work on some of the exercises on the stream. Uh, maybe when I'm done with my React 101 uh, thing, we can cover some of that. So maybe it doesn't exist in JavaScript. You can write it in JavaScript and you could use it. Um, so I want to show you like the canonical uh, curried function so that um, we, we can understand it. If you remember before, we had our add function, right? Add takes an x and a y, and it returns an x plus y. This is a binary function. It takes two arguments at the same time. And actually, if you would like to learn some of this functional programming jargon, uh, functional programming jargon, I think should pull up right there. There is this really great GitHub repo called functional programming jargon, which will cover so many of these words for you. See, arity is right there, higher order functions. We're gonna talk about these two. And actually, closure gets talked about inside of these two. And We've already talked about purity and side effects, and we'll get to composition. And uh, we talked a little bit about contracts. Uh, we haven't talked about point free or anything or some of these other ones. But um, this is a great repo. Check it out if you're at all interested in this stuff. Um, OK, so let's write this more elegantly. I'm going to call this the inelegant ad. I mean, it's elegant enough, but I think arrow functions make it slightly more elegant. So uh, uh, x and y 
and it returns x plus y. Look how terse that is. Look how, look how beautiful it is. I actually really love arrow functions. They're so, I'm so glad they're in the language now. All right, I'm about to blow your mind a little bit. Okay, so we know we've talked about how currying it's the act of taking a function that takes multiple arguments and instead takes them one at a time. Let's do it the inelegant way, and then I'll show you why it's so elegant with arrow functions. So instead of taking an x and a y, our function's only going to take an x, and what we're going to return is a new function that takes a y. And then from there, we're going to return x plus y. OK? I'm going to comment this out for now. Let's focus on what's going on up here. Right? We have a function that takes its first argument. It returns us a new function that's waiting to take its second argument. And then we're going to use both arguments in our final return. This should make a lot of sense to us. As, as JavaScripters. I do, I want to say this. The first time currying went in to my brain, like I learned it, like blew my mind. I mean, literally, like I was like, what? Um, all cartoony, just like that. It blew my mind. I literally had to drag my wife into this room and I drew it out for her on the board. She doesn't know crap about programming. She was just being super nice for me, but I was like so blown away about this because up until that moment until that moment that I understood that like you could change a function from being this right x and y and returning x plus y I had never thought of the fact that like if I need all these arguments I don't have to get them all at the same time like I just like I didn't even understand how someone's brain could conceive of, of of returning a new function. Like that didn't make any sense to me. And yet this has been around for almost a hundred years for mathematicians. This is this is nothing new to them. And yet, like no one had ever shown me this. This was so new. I just learned this like a year ago. And it's still to this to this day is like amazing to me that someone had the foresight to think, man, why do I need to take these all at the same time? What if I did this? What if I took one, I returned a new function that waited, and then I used it? Now, there's some powerful things going on here. I mentioned partial application. Well, if I use the inelegant, let's just call it add for now. I just want to call it inelegant because we have to use the, the function keyword and the returns and all that. But let's just call it uh, add for this moment. I can have something like add five. And literally, I can do this. I can call my add function. And what I can do is I can give it a five. And then this is a function, right? Like we could do console log type of add five. And let's do that. Let pretty girl fix this all up. I'm going to get rid of this. I don't need it for the moment. But let's call node on this node index js and we get a type of function right we're not getting a number we're getting a new function and then this function expects a second argument what we can do would be like 8 equals add 5 then let's give it its second argument this is the y up above right we're calling the function we're giving it its next argument and this time, uh, we will, instead of a type of, let's just do what 8 is. And 8 should equal 8. This should make sense, right? So the second argument was given to our returned function, right? But I can use add 5 over and over again. I could do const 12. Uh, I don't know why I gave it a new line, but equals add 5 and give it a new argument of 7. Right? This is what currying allows us to do. It allows us to partially apply arguments to our function. So let's log that out. Let's, let's log out 12. It should be 12. Right? 
and and that's cool like and to even kind of prove that this is the same function let's uh console log our our x inside of it now technically logging is impure so um don't call me an fp like non-purist right now because of that so but uh we should be able to when we get our result we can we should be able to see what was applied beforehand and we do like uh we can see the five being called and we know it's the same it's the same five here like that that's what it was and so that makes sense and uh i think that's really cool and you know beyond adding you could probably see how in your code like you've probably had two functions before that are almost identical save for like one last argument right like maybe x y and z and bar takes uh bar takes x y and a well you could have made a partially applied like um partially applied x and y and then foo can just get z and bar can just get a right these are the things that partial application gives us uh an opportunity to do is to dry up our code and reduce um, uh, we increase reuse of our functions now one thing I really want to point out is like and this is this is the this is the JavaScript technical interview part of of this occurring in partial application is we're using closure to give our returned functions the arguments we've already given it so this should be really obvious in this version of it, right? Uh, here I have access to X, but not to Y, right? Because I haven't even given it Y yet. I can console log X here. Um, and X is stored in the the first the big the out of scope of of add right that's what a closure is we we've held this in a state within our function and then here we can console log x and y because now we have access to the both which is why we're able to partially apply a number and and know that it'll it'll be there for us if i tried to console log y here this will return undefined because it's not been used yet. And let's just call that. See, it's undefined and it even just throws an error because it's it's not defined. It, it doesn't even know what I'm talking about yet. Um, so understanding JavaScript closures will help you really understand partial application and currying. Now let's write this in the elegant way. Let's write this with an arrow function. Const add equals x returns y returns x plus y look how gosh darn stinking pretty that arrow function is and it's curried right like we take our this add is a function that takes its first argument it returns a function expecting its second argument which returns the addition of both of these like once you get this drilled in your head like this becomes so easy to read and uh, this is what I love about curried functions and even writing my own curried functions is the ability to to do this um, and we'll see that everything still works uh, I can console log these out we'll console log add five and we'll console log eight and we'll console log twelve and we should see all the same results we had before uh, this time add five uh, we didn't do typo but it tells us it's a function right we can do typo and this should just say function boom so that is currying and partial application it's the act of taking a function that normally takes more arguments and returns new functions that only accept one argument at a time until we get to the end and we evaluate and it's awesome
So before I move on, I want to give you a chance to ask any questions that you might have. Let me hit, hit me up in the chat. Help me understand that, that you've got this. Even if it's just like, Kyle, you explained it so damn well. I now know it, and I feel like a mad scientist. And I'm going to go change my code base to only have curried functions. Let me know if you know it. I'm going to use this short moment. Take a sip of my beer. I don't know why I have to say it with some weird accent. It's just fun. Just have to, you know. Oh, good call. Well, yeah, I'm still using add five. That was that was the point, right? This returns a function. I was trying to show um, my buddy uh, Ruse Beth there. Um, I was trying to I was trying to show that like this becomes reusable through uh, the the partial application of a variable. And actually, like, let's start getting into slightly more interesting I examples. Like, um, so ads not all that interesting. What about what about array functions? So let's let's take map for example. Like we've all seen, like I can have an array equals one, two, three, four, five. And we've all seen r dot map uh, x, and maybe I want to double it, x times two. Okay, this should return. Let's let's uh let's log this out. Okay, we should get two, four, six, eight, ten. We do. So so most of you are probably familiar with using map, but. There's, there's an inconsistency with how to use map because we can't partially apply anything, right? Um, what if we change the order of the arguments? When we're doing currying, this is a really key point, and I wish I would have made it firsthand, but I'm making it now. The order of our arguments really matters. You want to supply the least stable argument as the final argument. And often in JavaScript, in most languages, it's the data. So let's write a curried version of map that's more reusable than just this array method, right? So we're going to write a map function, and we want to take the unstable part and make it our last argument. So what's the stable part of map? Well, the stable part of map is the callback. It's the function that we supply to map. So we'll take the function first. We'll return a new function, right? It's curried, so we're only taking one argument at a time, we're returning a new function, and we're gonna take the array as the second argument, and then we'll call we'll call this very thing on it, r.mapfn. There's no magic, right? Like, but what this will do, this map function now, this allows us to partially apply our functions and apply it to different arrays without having to rewrite stuff again. So let's write double equals map x returns x times 2. So I now have a partially applied function just waiting for an array. That's all it is. Just 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 dying for an array. So let's make a couple arrays. Let's make uh, const r2 equals I'm just gonna make some weird numbers 5, 6, D2, I guess, 5 again, 89. And then const r3 equals 0, negative 2, 4, 9, and 10, right? And now my, I can reuse double again and again and again by just doing this, r. And uh, we'll call it a couple more times. But this time, we'll apply it to our second and our third arrays, right? Because We've now rewritten this function. Instead of having to write this part again and again, I mean, I suppose we could just write uh, this as a function, and we could do this, like, um, we could do this uh, double, we could do const double callback equals x returns x times 2. Then we could do r.map double cb. 
and we could do r2.map double cb r3.map double cb but you can see how like this is a slight bit less uh, convenient to us right um, it's usable it's it's kind of nice and for someone who's not used to curried functions and functional programming this might be a very clean way to do it but but just with a little knowledge like we can make it so clean and it kind of reads we're going to double this array we're going to double r2 we're going to double this next array and, and let's log this out did i save it i did save it and we should see three arrays and boom like we've now been able to make a function that's already got its first argument and it's just it's just waiting it's a it's a beautiful thing so I, I hope this is starting to make sense, right? Like, not only can we change our, our functions to be curried and thus take one argument at a time, but because of JavaScript's closure, we're able to to partially apply what we want to do to this to our data, right? And we could make other ones. Instead of double, we could make const cube equals map of uh, x returns x. Um, uh, I I could I think I can use the exponentiation operator. I'm just gonna give it a try. Why not? It's the it's the way you learn. And this should triple them. Yeah, look at that exponent exponentiation operator, right? Like, um, beautiful thing. Like, it's a very it's a very easy concept once you you practice it and use it a bunch. And you could. And actually, in the next section, what I'm what I'm going to teach on, like, we'll start making more of these. We'll make filter. We'll make reduce. We'll make these curried functions so that we can use them over and over again. Um, so that's curried and partial application. Looks like Rusebad gets it. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I've never actually thought to ask, but I uh, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, let me know in the chat if there's anything about what I just did that's uh, a little confusing. Uh, we'll call this a path, like a partially applied function, also dying for an array. Like withering with desire. My wife uh, runs a, uh, a book review blog and she specifically focuses on romance and fantasy books. And um, it's uh so if you see me being slightly poetic with my comments that's about that's that's why okay so looks like lucas frosty is a little confused with line five all right i'm gonna go over it again lucas um so you're familiar probably with the map array prototype right it takes a callback function and that callback function has a signature of of um, if I remember right, the map callback signature it looks like this. It takes, it gives you the item, it um, the index, the array it's working on, and a, this argument, right? And then you want to make sure you return a value, and that gives you the new array you're going to end up with, right? That's how map works, and, and that's how the fun callback works there. Rather than having to call map, like dot map, using the dot chaining, uh, using the method itself on all these, we are using it, but we're going to use it under the hood. And we're going to make ourselves a curried version of the map method to use. So rather than having to call dot map on our arrays and pat and create that function right what we want to do is we want to make a curried version that takes our data our unstable argument as the last thing so we give it uh, the stable thing we want to partially apply and then we can just keep feeding that partially applied function whatever array we want and have that function do its do its thing on it right so what we did is we basically reverse the order Normally, map takes an array, map, and a function. What we're going to do, hey, my wife is bringing me home a piece of cheesecake. Sorry, this is important. Uh, yes, I'm even interrupting my stream 
to tell you this. You can't. You can't blame me. It's cheesecake. All right. So normally this is the order. Look at these three parts. Array, map, the method, and function. Right? So what if we take those three parts, array, map, and function, split them out, array, map, and function, and we change the order so that we can make it curried and more reusable. So what I did was I took the method and I made a function right here named after the method. So it's not the method, it's a function that's named the same as the method. And that's what we did. And then maybe instead of function, maybe I should call it callback. Like, this is the callback we're gonna hand to map, right? Uh, we'll call it callback here. And that's what you see here. We're using the normal thing, but we're what we're doing is we're actually gonna change it so we can give the function first and the array second. And then, after we have all our arguments, we then call the method to do our job, right? So, um, we've that's what you're seeing here. This is a callback that we are um, we're going to give our map function, hold it in closure, and wait for the array, and then hand it off later. Like we handed it off at one point here, right? And um, so that's what we're gonna do. Like if I showed you filter, it's the same thing, right? It's a callback, and then an array, and then we're gonna call array.filter and the callback, right? If I made reduce, it's, uh, it's slightly different because we want to get all the pieces necessary for a reduce callback. Um, you could just do callback. I don't like doing that. I kind of like doing um, reduce can be, um, oh, yeah, I guess you could do it that way. Callback r r dot reduce callback. The difference is with the reduce callback, it requires two arguments. So one thing you can do instead is, um, is oh, you also want to supply an ac, sorry, uh, starting like a starting value. That's a long name. I wouldn't actually use it, but reduce also takes a starting value. Um, so I hope you can see what we're we're doing there. We're we're taking the functionality. We're using the same functionality. But we're making curried versions that allow us to partially apply the functions, the callbacks that we want to use again and again and again. And so we don't have to keep writing dot chains. Okay? If that's still confusing, um, I'm going to ask you to just bear with me. It'll start to make some sense. I promise it'll start to make more sense. Uh, but that is that is currying and partial application. Currying, make functions, take one argument at a time. We want to make sure that the argument that's got the least stability is our final argument so that we can partially apply in closure the stable parts, such as our callback function that doesn't change. And then we can supply it the changing data, the arrays, the numbers, the, the strings, etc. Okay. We have finally gotten to what is the crux of the meat and potatoes of all of this. And the most important thing I want you to take away, which is, I'm going to blow this all away for right now. We have finally gotten to composition. Who's excited about composition? Like composition, like, like I know you maybe don't know what it is, but I hope like you are excited with me and you are ready to like get to the the, the finish line, like this, this thing that's going to just change the way you think about creating functions in your programs. Okay. Um, so to explain composition kind of requires going back in our, our way, way back machines. Like if I had some music right now, the right, like something that would, uh, put you in like some kind of, um, flashback in a TV show. If I could, I would do that right now. Because I want you to flash back to high school, and I want you to flash back to math, and I know it might be terrifying for some of you. So I want to say, we can do this. You can learn it. You've got this. Stay with me. 
don't get scared. Your boy Kyle is here for you, all right? I'm here for you. We're going to get through this. You might remember from high school math seeing something that looked like this. f of x equals y, okay? Stay calm. This is a function that takes one argument and maps to a single y. Like, this is what's wonderful about math is that our function will always only return, always only return one y, right? I, it, right, like it'll, we'll always get one y for every x that we give it. Unlike our functions in our programs where if we're writing in pure ones, like we might get any number of things. This is why purity matters, right? Like, or why like you shouldn't write arguments that take, I mean, you shouldn't write functions that take eight arguments. That is, that is ridiculous. Okay, Jen says she's not going back to high school, not doing it. To be fair, I fucking hated high school too. It was a bad time. So I'm sorry for making you go back to high school. I just want you to recall maybe some of the math you learned during that horrific, terrible time. Sorry. I hope I didn't cause anyone to have some like uh, trigger, like post-traumatic stress disorder, flashback to Vietnam type crap. I'm sorry. So moving on f of x always returns a y. Now, you might have also seen g of x returns a, another y. Let's Instead of calling it y, let's call it a z, right? Now, what you might already know, because we can combine functions as first class citizens, higher order functions, uh, purity, and uh, yeah, those things, we can do something like this. We can do f g of x and return a value, right? G of x is gonna return z, z is fed to f and returns a y, right? Like, like the this is kind of what that refactoring I was talking about earlier. Essentially, this is the same as doing, g, uh, storing g of x is something like const g of x, like const z equals g of x, and feeding z, uh, z into our function. Does that make sense? The result of one function is immediately fed into another function. That is composition. Composition is this, right? Except this can get really, really ugly. Let's make an ugly version. I'm gonna make curried versions of some string functions. So const, Scream will take a string and return string to uppercase, okay? Const exclaim will take a string and return, uh, we'll wanna return that string with an exclamation point. If I could use template literals, I can't seem to type. Uh, boom, we've exclaimed it. And repeat will equal a string that uh, will return the string and a space and the string, okay? I've made these, these quick things. Now, I can make uh, a new function that utilizes these functions. Notice that their types are all the same. They all take a string and they return a string. In fact, we can write out some types, right? Like uh, scream. This is called um, the Hindley-Milner type system. It's uh, if you've used TypeScript or Flow, this will kind of make some sense to you, but um, I, I'm not making this up out of the blue. And it returns a string, and then I'm actually just gonna, because these all have the same uh, signatures, right? Like, I exclaim and repeat. Like, these all have the same signatures, which is helpful, because it means that we can trust passing the return of one into the uh, as the argument of the other ones. So what if we did something like warn Bob? I don't know who Bob is, but I wanted to choose a name that I don't think anyone's named in my, in my stream. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, I don't know. But let's warn Bob. And what warning of Bob might be is we're gonna first, we're gonna first scream 
Bob, the world is coming to an end. But we'll also want to exclaim it, so we have to wrap that, right? Like we're getting the return. That's our first part of our composition. And then we might want to repeat it because Bob's so thick-headed and deaf that he doesn't know that we yelled at him, right? So um, we have this warm... Uh, we have this warm Bob, right? And we can console log the result of warm Bob. And it should be, um, it should be, uh, Bob, the world is coming to an end, exclamation point. Bob, the world is coming to an end, exclamation point. Let's hope I got this right. There it is, look at that. So this is a composition, right? But but this is kind of ugly. Like my pr my prettier even was like, dude, this is too much. Like, it's not cool, man. Like you could split it on the other lines, but this is just kind of weird to follow. What if I told you that there was a way that using this currying that we could make the Warren Bob function and then then pass it the string as the second argument. And this is, this is what functional programming, this is what functional composition looks like. We don't have to nest these. What if these were really long names, like finish transaction and uh, check that there's enough money in the bank or uh, check that this user I can't spell user has a bank account like you could see in a situation where this would be really big nasty and ugly there's another way to do this if you've used uh, the Ramda library or the Lodash FP library you've probably come across a function called compose compose let's write out the type uh, above it if I could um, compose is going to take any number of functions so uh, we'll just say functions and I, I'm actually not even entirely sure how I'm gonna write this out but it, by the end it'll return a function compose will give us a function it's a higher order function but let's write this what functions is is it takes an array of functions, actually, that might be a good way. It's not truly an array. We're gonna hand it just its functions as arguments and create an array out of it using the uh, rest operator. Um, and then from here, we're gonna give it a value. Let's call that value, let's call it a value. And then what we're gonna call is we're gonna, if you've noticed in the read, like what this is actually, um, we call, it's called right to left, right? We call the inner thing first, it's returned to the outer thing and the outer thing and the outer thing. So we actually want to operate on the functions we give a compose function from right to left or from bottom to top. We don't actually wanna work left to right. The more mathematical way is right to left. This is one of the tough things to get in your head is that uh, compose is kind of backwards. But we're gonna use reduce right. So you've heard of reduce, I used it earlier, but there's actually reduce right, which is the same thing, but it operates on an array from the back to the front, rather from the front to the back. That's the difference. But we're gonna call reduce right and uh, we're gonna have our accumulated and our current item, which is a function. And we're gonna return calling the, the function on the accumulated value. In fact, actually, this is why I prefer to write this this way. And then we start, our starting point, our first function is called with the value that we give it. So this is a little confusing maybe looking at this. Let me save this real quick. Compose takes some functions. It creates an array out of them using um, the ES6 um, rest operator that's gathering together. And then it returns a function that's waiting a value. In this case, when we compose these, it'll wait for a string. 
And what it will do is for each function it's given, starting from the end of the array, working back, it'll take that array and it'll give it the current value. And the very first value in a reduce is the starting value here. In this case, it's the x, which will be the string. So we can write warn Bob this way. Const warn Bob is a composition. We'll write compose. I'll split it on the other lines. And very simply, the same way, if you remember, we first screamed at him, and then we exclaimed at him, and then we repeated at him. So now, warn Bob is a function. This is a function. We can even verify that type of warn Bob. Let's save this and let's let's call that. Let's just see that it's a function. It's a function. And then let's supply the string, right? Const string equals Bob the world is coming to an end. And we'll log that out. Warn Bob. And it's waiting for its x, right? We haven't given that to him. So let's give it its x, which in this case is the string. And we should see the exact same result we saw before by doing the weird way, like the, the nested way. And boom, look at that. You can see this was the old way. This is the new way. We have now used composition to combine these three functions and create a new function out of them that are waiting its final argument. So you've just seen that compose, repeat, exclaim, scream, and string is equivalent to um, repeat, exclaim, scream, string. I, I, I realize I need to bump that up so you can see it behind my, my face. Who's with me? Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. Like, this is a little mind blowing to me that these two things are equivalent. Feel free to ask some questions. Feel free to make me repeat stuff. Like, that's okay. I'm gonna take some sips of my beer. I'm gonna give you all a moment to like, maybe your mind is too blown at the moment. Maybe you don't know what to ask. That's fine. Man, I'm not going to lie. Knowing my wife is coming home with cheesecake has, has gotten me pretty excited. You're, you're right, Jen. My wife is the best. She actually thinks you have to be pretty awesome. She, um, when I told her I have this friend who's not only super supportive, but um, like does all the crafty things you do, like she was like, she seems awesome. Like I would really enjoy her. I think the two of you would get along. Um, all right. I'm not really seeing any any questions. I'm hoping the feed is still working. I'm hoping everyone's with me. Can you show the compose function, please? Sure. Let's get rid of all this noise. All right, let's push it down. And let's bring this into focus. All right, so compose is a function that takes any number of functions, right? Um, if you understand, uh, like if you have a function, you might have seen this, right? And now args is uh, is an is an array, right? Like this is a way to make a true array out of it. Um, so compose will take any number of functions and return a new function out of those functions that's waiting for its x. And then what it'll do is it'll work itself from the back of the array to the front of the array, passing in the accumulated value each time. Maybe instead of value, accumulated value. And instead of x, it's, uh, I should really turn off my, my mess notifications. Um, it's starting value. Sorry if I wrote it too terse. That's my bad. Uh, starting value. Let's see if that... Oh. Get out of here! 
Okay. Uh, I see Luke is kind of mentioning pipes. Pipes is the opposite, right? So the only difference between compose and pipes is that, or pipe is sometimes called flow um, in Lodash FP, I think it is. Um, a pipe goes left to right, compose goes right to left. Um, we can write pipe really quickly. Pipe equals same thing. We're going to take any number of functions, and we're going to return we're going to return a function that's expecting a starting value. And we're going to take the functions. We're going to reduce them uh, going from left to right instead of right to left. And the first thing is our accumulated value and the current function. And we're going to call that on our accumulated value. And we're gonna give our starting value as the first accumulated value. That's how reduce works. So these are these are the opposites. Um, so uh, th these are these are opposite. Um, compose is considered the more mathematical way to do things because compose follows the nested uh, version of things. Whereas um, pipe doesn't have that same nesting. Like um, I can't really like make uh, like down here. I made compose of these things in the string is the same as these things. Sorry, I just heard a weird noise in my house. Please give me a moment. Sorry, everyone, uh, no big deal. Uh, my toilet started filling up out of nowhere, so I hope I don't have some weird weird leak. Uh, if it keeps running, I'll have to go check on that really quick. Um, but there's not exactly the same thing with, with, with pipe, because I can't, I can't unnest these. I can't do it um, some other, other way. So that's why you'll probably see people typically use Compose more often and functional programming than pipe. But they are very similar, and um, you know you're always able to use what makes sense for you or or and or for your team. So that's good to know. Um, let's see. Uh, Lucas mentions, do you think pipe should be implemented in JS? And in Elm, you can choose the side you want using uh, the pipeline operator going either ways. So. Um, Slightly off the topic of this, but make to your question, yes, uh, the pipeline operator is in stage one of uh, TC39 proposal. So we will someday have, a, we'll probably have a pipeline a a operator similar to Elixir. For those of you who have uh, used Elixir before and seen that, that would be something like um, uh, R, and we're going to pipe it to a map. Um, and then we'll be, after that, we'll pipe it to a filter. And after that, we'll pipe it to another map or something. I don't know. Like, we will we'll probably get these someday in our, um, in JavaScript. They're at a stage one proposal. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Compose takes any number of functions it returns a new function waiting for the starting value, the first value you want to start with, and then it that returns a func that returns the reduction from uh, from the back from the final from the last function you gave it to the first one, feeding values into each other. It's basically unnesting. Um, like what we could do maybe is. Um, do, do fun no or arrow functions don't have names so I can't call like function dot name and show you what I'm talking about but um, uh, yeah I don't think it'll show anything I could console log the function name here but it wouldn't do anything for you but we could we could do this we could um, We could do console law. We could do const result equals uh, fn uh, an accumulated value 
we can log the result and we can return the result. And that might give you a slightly clearer understanding of, of what's going on there, uh, Ruzba. Um, and I'm gonna get rid of this last line since it's nonsense. So we should be able to console log out the, the accumulated value each time. Um, and actually we can, let's also console log, let's do that, let's console log the accumulated value so you know it's getting passed in and uh, we'll say passed in and we'll say passed out or like it's like return right like so I hope I hope this will make it make some sense so we know that our compose is a type of function that's what that one was we passed in Bob the world is coming in and we got out the first time we got out the uppercase one right the screaming so the second time we passed in that result and we got out the exclaimed we added an exclamation part to the end and the third function for repeat we passed in Bob the world is coming to an end we passed in the string and it passed out the the doubled set uh, the repeated sentence right and then our end result as we were console logging at the end of the file was that does that make sense like that's how this compose function works if we call it the other way um, with just reduce and it's actually a pipe right like this is now a pipe just imagine it as a pipe I don't feel like changing it everywhere in the file you'll see everything works out backwards right it repeated it first and so we actually got a slightly different response because it repeated with the pipe we only add one exclamation point right and then we scream which capitalizes the whole thing but we didn't add like um, we didn't have the two exclamations so in this case pipe and compose gave us just slightly different results but but that's what that was compose is a reduce rate so uh, I hope that makes sense uh, it sounds like you looks like you got it uh, de nada my Spanish is awful I'm sorry uh, I took five years of it in school and it did not it didn't stick enough um, you just you got to use it you use it or you lose it um, I've been starting to think of doing some like Duolingo stuff and maybe someday traveling uh, somewhere and like just trying to at least know enough to get by and ask for cerveza and the baño and all that stuff so all right so we have this composition let's actually make it useful like we haven't really seen how to make it useful or refactor any code. So I'm gonna take a second and I'm actually gonna go steal some code from my own my own repo. So I guess it's not stealing. It's just finding where I put it. And uh, I, I gave this talk to, um, is this one? Nope, this isn't it. Uh, I gave this talk to my, my teammates on, um, I gave this talk to my teammates on Wednesday. And so, uh, come to Brazil. We don't speak Spanish, but we have be beaches. I know even less of Portuguese, but uh, maybe someday I'll get there. Uh, it would be really cool to come talk to like Brazil JS someday. So uh, maybe I will. I'll follow in the footsteps of my friend Jem Young. I know he did one of the, I think he did one of the keynotes this year at Brazil JS. That would be really cool. Um, I'm going to steal the code from here, um, and you can see I even reference the Dr. Boolean stuff. I'm just going to copy it, and boom, you're going to see all this, this stuff in here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to reduce its size just a little bit. Um, I'm going to get rid of the, this part. We're going to do a few exercises here real quick, and I will get rid of the one that uses accounting. Yeah, we'll, we'll get rid of that. We're not going to export anything right now. We're not doing any tests. But I want to show you how we can combine all these things we've learned tonight. So we have our compose function available to us. And I've made some useful curried functions. All right? We're all, we've already seen map. 
We've already seen filter. I showed you reduce. It takes a function, the accumulator, and the array. But I've added some new ones. I've added a prop, which is a way of getting a property off of an object really well. And what that does is we give it a key, right? We are giving it the stable part. We'll know what key we want to get off our object, and then we'll give it the object. And then I've also added some other array ones. Actually, maybe I should move these up. We'll call these uh, array functions or functions. Yeah, let's call them. They're not methods. Um, object functions. But with these, we can do some really cool things. So uh, I have this data structure here. I have some books. Um, titles, authors, dollar values, in stock, that sort of thing. And we can do these exercises that I came up with, and they're heavily borrowed from the Mostly Adequate Guide, um, but we can make these with compositions. So let's look at this one, uh, last in stock. So what we want to do is we want to get the last object out of our array of books, and we want to return whether it's in, in stock or not, right? And we can see uh, an imperative way to do it. Get the last book, last, out of the books passed to this function, and return the prop in stock from the last book. An even more imperative way would be to like, um, if we didn't have those functions above, you might do something like, uh, like, uh, books, like return books, uh, books dot length minus one to get the last one dot or you could do in stock or you could do it with dots I don't know if actually that works within dot, dots there but you could do in stock right and this would be kind of a, a painful way to do it but it's a way you could do it but we can rewrite this with as a composition okay so we use compose and the way I like to think of compose is like, what's the last thing we need? Well, we need the in stock function. Hi, kitty. Sorry, my cat decided to join me as she does every week. Um, so what we can do is, um, well, let's write it from start to finish, but we know we have to add our arguments in reverse order. That's, that's maybe a good way to think about it. So we need the last book. So the first thing we can do is we can get last. And we just call last here. Oh, I hit caps lock. We call last, okay. We've called our, we've got our last book. And then the, the last book is still going to be, um, we need to get a property off of our, our, our object. So we should have an object after this one. And so what we can do is we can do prop in stock, right? And that's all this function becomes. It goes from being that two, three liner to that required some interim variables to this. It's a function that will get the last book and it'll give you the value from this prop and it should return false. So I'm gonna save that and we'll call a note on that. And the first one, you saw it right here, exercise one, is false. That's what we expected. We can see that it's false and we did that. And it's really short, it's really terse. Um, that's really cool, let's do it again. Um, exercise two, use compose, prop, and first to get the title of the first book. Okay, this is almost identical. We use our compose, we know we want the first book. We've wrote our function first up here, right? First takes an array and returns the first one. We call first. And then we'll call prop uh, title. It's almost identical. But this was just to kind of get uh, comfortable with a couple composes. All right? And uh, our first title is 1984. So exercise two should say 1984 now. And it does. Awesome. Okay. Let's, go, let's keep going. We're doing great. Exercise three. We're going to use compose, prop, map, and filter to return all the dollar values less than 10. Okay, that's a little challenging, but we can do it. We totally can do it. Okay, so the first thing we can do is we can filter the books 
for, um, actually, let's do this. Let's map our books and return only array of the dollar values, right? So um, let's map. But here's the great thing about these curried functions and how they work. Like I can use prop inside of map because it's a curried function. It's still going to wait for the last argument. So in this case, it's going to get the object. It's going to give me back the value. And then that value is going to be handed to map. And so I'll have a new array of those uh, values. In this case, we want the dollar values. You see what I did there? I've called a map and I've propped on this. I'm going to give you a little hint. This could also be a composition of map and prop dollar values. If you get into the um, if you get into the mathematics of it, you learn about associativity and why like these things are equivalent. Um, okay. So at this point, we have an array of our dollar values. We want to filter for dollar values that are less than 10. We'll just give this one a lambda. We'll give it an, an argument. So x and return x's that are less than 10. Um, and then, and then that's, that's, that should be all this becomes. It's a simple two-line function. Excuse me. You're not supposed to scratch the carpet right there. Please don't do that. Thank you. Sorry. You know, good pet parent have to discipline your your pet once in a while. So less than ten should return the book uh, the dollar values for this and this and and this. Excuse me. She's getting hungry. My wife will be here in just a moment, so she'll be able to handle that. Um. So yeah. Um, we now have our dollar values. We should see see those when they come back. Empty array. I messed something up. Okay, what did I mess up? Oh, I said dollar values instead of dollar value. That would make sense. Boom! And we see the dollar values that are less than 10. If we wanted uh, something else, we could do... Um, we could compose these things as well. We could do, um, you know, uh, we could work on it. Uh, okay, we got, um, we can do average dollar values. Cool. So I'll rewrite the average dollar value function with composition. I gave you the averaging function which is, uh, it takes, a lot of times you'll see this in functional programming, rather than saying like an array of things, you'll see X's um, instead of X, like X is a singular, X is, is an array. Um, so we're given X's right now, and we're gonna call the reduce function on it. Reduce first takes um, uh, the callback function, and in this case, it's just adding them. And then it get, takes a starting value, and then it takes the array, and then we're just dividing it by the length of the array, and we're getting the average. So how could we rewrite this? Like, we're going to map each book and return the dollar value, and then we need to average all of the dollar values, right? Like, we can rewrite this. This ain't no, this ain't no thing, right? We can compose. We already know how to get our dollar values. Map prop dollar value. And then we just call average on that array. Boom, refactor, like it should be 10. And it is, it's still 10. We are killing it, we're doing, we're doing awesome. What about this? This last one is kind of a challenging one. Write a function, sanitize names. It returns a list of lowercase underscored book names. You will need to use compose and write curried versions of lowercase, underscore, and replace. So let's write curried versions of these, right? Like we know that curried versions take, um, in this case, it takes a string, it's a unary function, string to lowercase, right? So that's a curried lowercase. Replace takes a pattern and a, a, a value to return like uh, a separator right so like or not a separator um, a replacement 
So replace takes, um, we'll give it a pattern and then we'll also give it a replacement and finally a string and we will call um, string replace uh, pattern replacement and we'll get rid of these. Does that make sense? I hope it does. That's our curried version of replace. An underscore would be, um, underscore will take a string and it'll take a string last, I think, hold on. Yeah, underscore will take a string and return replace um, our pattern I think I may have done this a little wrong. It might take me a second to think through this. Sorry, folks. Um, okay, underscore should take a uh, replacement, then a string. I may have done these a bit wrong. I'm trying to remember how I did it. My brain is getting a little fried at the end of a long day. All right, you know what we can just do? We can just JavaScript. Let's, let's verify string replace. String dot replace. Verify how it works. Takes a regex and a new substitution. That makes sense. Oops. So we want to switch that so that it takes, uh, let's call this the regex. Um, and then replacement is fine. We called that. So underscore is actually replace with the pattern and uh, what we want to replace it with. We want to give it the replacement of that and then it's waiting for the string waiting for the string. That's that's the key. That's it. That's that's what I'm doing. All right. So now as a composition, we want to get uh, the book name. So we're going to map over each book and we're going to return the prop of title. It's not a name. I really title. We will now have the title. So what we want to do is we want to uh, lowercase them so we can call lowercase. And then lastly, we want to underscore them. So that's our composition. And you can see like once you've done the hard work of like curring your functions, making a composition to actually do the work is such a lot. It's so easy to read the logic, right? Like, okay, map four titles, then lowercase those titles then give them underscores instead of spaces. Like that's what this is doing. It's replacing white space with underscores. Um, and we can run node and uh, two lowercase is not a function. What did, oh, what did I, uh, string JavaScript. What am I missing? Two lowercase. Method returns calling a string with. Oh. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. So that's what this makes sense. Okay. So when I map this, I'm getting an array of titles, right? So I have an array here. I don't have a string. So what I can do is again, map to lowercase and again map to underscore all right so this is one way to write this I screwed up how did I screw up okay I should have an array of titles and I should be calling lowercase on them right so let me teach you a little trick. I want to uh, trace will take a value. 
And what we will do is we'll console log out the value and return the value. So I should be able to, oh, we also want to give it a string. So we can do string value. Trace uh, after title. So this should do this, and then it should tell me uh, it should tell me what the after title value is. Okay, that works. So after lowercase. So now you're learning how to debug functional code. Okay, that's good. I must have wrote something wrong with my underscore. Ah. Okay, that's a good cat. He is, uh, he, oh, what did I do? Stop that. After underscore. If any of you see my error, please let me know. Somehow I've gotten a function back. I've, I've missed something in underscore. Uh, oh, underscore should, that's what I did. String, return, replace, a string. That's what underscore is meant to be. That should work. Right? Underscore takes a string, calls replace, regex, replacement, string. String dot replace that. It's taking the pattern. That's my regex. It's taking the replacement. It's getting the replacement. It's getting the string. Well, why don't we do this? Let's eliminate the uh, middleman. Uh, underscore will take a string. Oh, is that what I'm missing? I've already supplied it. So un I've already supplied it here. Oh, that, it's my own fault. Silly me. That's what I did wrong. Boom. So, okay, what I did wrong was um, I, I incorrectly gave it both arguments within one call. And silly me, we've been talking about it all night. A curried function only takes one argument at a time. So that was my bad. That was stupid of me. Um, but, you know, you live and learn. and you make. Uh, that's part of what I love about doing the stream is just like, learning how to handle these problems and do it under pressure and uh, I think it really helps and I was able to show you this really helpful function if you start doing this stuff the trace will really come to your uh, rescue from time to time and so we can get rid of the, the trace now that we know that our composition works okay so we can show that they'll they're all underscored properly but this is kind of crazy why am I calling map all these times when I could do uh, another composition right like so I showed you earlier that um, like mapping um, where did I put it did I save it yeah right here so um, mapping a prop of dollar is the same as composing map and uh, the prop dollar value right those are the same I could work out the math for you but another way I could write this instead of this is as a nested composition so I can compose, uh, a com uh, I can nest comp compose, right? And what we'll do is we'll get the prop title. Um, we will lowercase it and we will underscore it. And then I can get rid of these and these are the, the same. We can map the composition And that's another thing about functional programming is when you understand the laws and the contracts that you're making, um, 
with your code and your functions, when you understand these, refactors become uh, very easy to do. Um, and you can see all these same correct ways of handling um, the same code. It's, 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 it's very legible. Um, other ways to do this would be, um, so you could do this, map underscore, uh, you can map the composition of underscore and lowercase, and you can map the, um, the prop uh, title and maybe that makes a little more sense to your brain to read it this way right like first give me an array of all the titles and then over that array do the composition of these functions and that this should also be equivalent and it is so um, that is composition folks like any number of array I mean functions then hand it its value and you start to realize like you can write all sorts of functionality without ever needing to use like inner rim uh, variables. If you were to use a library like Ramda, um, let me pull it up, uh, Ramda JS, this is a functional programming library. It's similar to Lodash and Lodash has a functional programming version called Lodash FP. But uh, Ramda like gives you um, all of these curried functions already they give you some other magic so you you need to read the docs to understand but um like they give you all these curried functions and you can use composition to just um uh you know build up your programs with all this all these things partial application and compositions it's it's mind-blowing what you can write um and what's great about it is it actually gets really testable, right? Like, I can easily test any of these functions I've made because they're all pure, right? And that, because they're pure, I can have really high confidence in the composition of them as long as I'm matching the types, right? That was the mistakes I was making. Uh, I wasn't getting quite the right type. Um, into the next function, right? Uh, I was returning an array when I needed to return a string, right, for example. But once I match up the types, like everything works. And it's, I mean, once you do it a few times, it just starts to become like, um, you just start to wonder why you do things another way. There's more danger in the other way. I have to write more code the other way. So, um, that's what I have for you guys. This is my intro to functional programming. I have to condense it down to 30 minutes and I won't be answering uh, questions but um, during the talk, but maybe people will ask me in the hallway and stuff like that. But, but um, yeah, Th thank you for working through this with me. Are there, are there any questions about these exercises? I, ho I was hoping they would actually show like how composition works and, and you can actually go do them yourself uh, I can this isn't private um, so you can go to Kyle Shevlin uh, github.com slash Kyle Shevlin slash FP dash composition dash exercises and there's actually a, a unit test in there um, like we can look at the test file really quick and uh, you know it just tests that the answers are what you expect um, and, and you can go check this out I've now shown you how to answer a bunch of these but that doesn't mean you'll remember it so if you want to please go check it out and do it and uh let me know let me know how it goes maybe i can help you out uh you can submit um your own exercise or what whatnot um the main point i'm making is like uh this is just an introduction there's so much more to learn and do and i know i have a ton to learn uh and but i'm, I'm really thankful that y'all y'all stuck with me and uh went through this with me I hope I've I hope I've taught you a few things so um, I want to take a little bit of time to answer any questions you might have regarding what we talked about um, but also uh, so my wife did get home I would like to spend some time with her in a little bit so uh, let's I'll give you all five to ten minutes to uh, ask me whatever you want uh, I like to end my streams with that letting people um, take some time to just you know share some thoughts or that kind of thing so I haven't seen anyone chat in a little while I don't know how many people are there 
Uh, I hope you're still there. I hope you haven't fallen asleep. Or maybe you're like, uh, maybe you're four beers in because you're not talking the whole time. And maybe you've you've passed out a little bit. I, I, I don't know. But, um, Lucas, based on what you were um, writing, it looks like you've you've had some good experience with Elm. That's really cool. Um, I wrote a little bit of Elm. I'd really like to get into it more at some point. Um, I actually think I'm going to check out Reason and Mel, though, based on my love of React. Um, and uh, I think this is the thing I'm going to start diving into next. Um, so the guy who wrote React, Jordan Walk, also wrote this. He wrote uh, Reason. And uh, I, I think it's very uh, Elmy, kind of, uh, except it's based on OCaml and, and does compile to JavaScript. But um, I think I'm going to start working on this and learning it. I'm going to spend some time with a friend of mine, um, Kevin Davis, and I think we're going to work through it together and start learning this. So pretty excited about it. Um, I, you know, it's not quite as big as Elm, but um, I'm wondering, I, I wonder if it might catch on. So I thought I would share this resource. Uh, Jen is just knitting. That makes sense. Um, knitting away at her stockings. Actually, Jen, send me, a, send me a tweet sometime of like what cost it would take. Like how much money should I send you to get me like a cool floppy beanie? of some sort um, that would be really cool uh, I, I would love me a floppy beanie uh, I can measure my head if necessary but I would send you the monies for that and I would finally get my uh, my album to you so M.A. Greenberg uh, or Ma Greenberg I'm not sure um, says thanks for sharing well thank you for watching I really appreciate it like I'm still a little blown away that people would uh, spend their evening and their time hanging out with me as I write code and I ramble on and on and on. So Lucas says, hey Kyle, great stream. I'm a React programmer and I just want to understand how this can fit in my daily work. Do you have any example of how to use it uh, with React or even with Redux? Absolutely. So here's ways it could work with React. Uh, react itself um, let me make a new f let me uh, get rid of this so in react you have this dot set state right this dot set state has two signatures it could take an object where uh, we merge properties together but there's some challenges with this if I call these four synchronously like I don't get the same updates like like if a is actually supposed to increment uh, this like a is maybe it's this dot state a plus one and I did that four times in a row but I did it as objects you might know that these all get merged together and you don't get an a that's four times greater you only get an a that's one time greater that's one point greater so that's why set state has a second signature this dot set state has a function signature that gives you the previous state and the current props and you need to return the next state right so if you know something about this and especially if you don't need the props but if I call this several times if I did a is prev state plus one and then I call this several times. What's great about these is that they don't get merged together. They're instead thrown in a queue. So the first uh, set state call one, set state call two, and so on, right? So, okay, we have a common signature that we can see over and over again, right? One thing you could do throughout your application is you can write, you can write these. Um, you could write a key and return uh, and a state like and return key plus an object that's key plus one. This might not be the absolute correct way to do it. 
so forgive me. But then you can write increment A. And you can reuse it. Increment B. You and you can write the opposite like const decrement. Sorry, I should actually write it this way. Um, sorry, I messed that up. But if you started to notice like state gets taken maybe decrement's not a great one but maybe you had other ones maybe you needed to do stuff with strings or arrays or something you could then make a composition uh, state update it this function that function and compose and then state update is just waiting for state. And so you could literally create, you can compose a state update and give it this, right? So that's one way you could use it. You could also use it in action creators to do, if you needed to do complex actions, you could do compose uh, this action, that action, those actions right like these are ways you could do that but you're already using some functional programming techniques in react and redux functional programming um, requires the use of immutable data structures so if you're using redux you've already run into this in fact you're already running into um, partially applied functions if you use the react redux package uh, the connect function uh, is a partially applied slash curried function. You give it map state to props. I can't spell. Map dispatch to props, right? And then you give it the component. That's a curried function because if you think about it, connect equals um, A, B, C, and D. There's four arguments and then uh, waits for a component and then gives you uh, the component I can't spell and it does some shenanigans to actually make this work but you know it spreads out A and B and C and D so you're using higher order functions uh, inside of uh, react already so um, you're you're using a lot of these techniques without maybe even realizing you're using them um, I think rather than like this would be kind of somewhat separate from ui right like this is about like how to handle logic so you might find ways to compose uh a actions or especially in utility functions that you might use throughout your app there might be usefulness in currying them and composing them so uh that's why i think it's helpful to know this stuff so i hope that's a, a satisfying answer uh ma greenberg asked do you ever code in react native uh, up to this point, I haven't really done that. Uh, I've done like one little side project thing and I didn't even finish it. So um, sorry, I haven't. But um, my buddy, uh, Jamin Holmgren, uh, he, he's potentially going to, um, we might do a co-stream uh, one night and we'll have him uh, help me do an introduction to like React Native. He's very big, he runs a React Native conference here in Portland. Um, and he really knows his, uh, his React Native stuff. And so I think that would be, uh, that's going to be a cool thing if we ever get it set up. I hope we do. Um, he's a great guy. And I think y'all will really enjoy uh, getting to know him a little bit. So, um, yeah. Uh, you know, as I always say, I just want to thank you all for spending your time with me this evening. Uh, I, had a, I had a blast. I had a whole lot of fun uh, describing uh, functional programming to everyone. 
Uh, and I really enjoyed like being able to um, take some extra time and, and explain things. I know this stuff can be a little confusing. Uh, I've had the benefit of trying to learn it for probably the better part of six months or more now, maybe a little more. Um, but yeah, uh, I just, I'm so thankful that people come and hang out with me. Um, I know I've said it before and I'll say it again probably, but you know, as an extrovert, coding can be really actually challenging. I love coding. I love, I love programming and I love creating new things and solving it, but uh, it can be really isolating and lonely if you don't reach out to people and you don't interact with others. And doing a Twitch stream has become a really great way for me to get to know a few of you really well and to get to know um, the people who follow me on Twitter and just even to help people out. I'm always amazed that people come out and, and hang with me. So um, I really appreciate it. Um, Lucas says, okay, thank you very much, man. This type of content with this quality for free is a rare thing nowadays. Well, you're, you're right. And uh, uh, I'm not going to wall off. I'm going to keep Twitch streaming, but I've been really excited. Uh, this past week, some other good news is I was added as an instructor to Egghead.io. So I'm going to start working on some courses, uh, probably a React Beginners course, and uh, maybe an intro to functional programming course um, just like this and I, I will put them up there so that you have the really condensed uh, versions I'm not gonna stop streaming I love it I'm really enjoying uh, spending the time but uh, there's no reason I shouldn't try and reach a bigger audience or I shouldn't try and uh, you know um, honestly I, I don't mean this to be um, don't think ill of me, but making passive income is, is an interest of mine. And so uh, I would really love to be able to teach this, spread it out. And if I make a little extra money off of it, that's great. It goes to my debts. It goes to my retirement. It goes to buying a home finally. So maybe someday instead of my, my office that is not just my office, but it is my wife's office. Uh, I'm going to show you real quick. She's got a standing desk over here. I actually did a couple episodes from that desk. Um, it's got my hand-built workbench there. And I'm sorry I'm blinding you with the light. But it's also like my music studio. My guitar is there. My piano is here. Um, it would be kind of nice to have a little more of a, a dedicated space someday. So pretty excited about the Egghead I.O. opportunity. Uh, nervous to come up with classroom, like coursework material kind of thing, but I think it'll go well. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. All right, it's 945. I'm going to spend some time with my wife. I'm going to eat that. Um, I'm going to eat that cheesecake and uh, y'all have a very pleasant evening. Thank you for hanging out with me. Uh, we'll do it again soon. I'll be on stream again later this week. Uh, not this week uh, being Saturday, but the next week uh, before Thanksgiving. It'll probably be Tuesday. Um, I'll be sure to tweet it out to all y'all. So check my Twitter. Um, if you're not already following me, my Twitter handle is the same as my Twitch handle, Kyle Shevlin. Come hang out. Send me some messages. My DMs are always open. Have a good night. Bye.